Um, let me go ahead and introduce uh, um, Peter. Uh, so Dr. Santa Maria uh, was, is actually from Australia, um, did his medical school at the University of Western Australia before undertaking his residency in otolaryngology. Uh, he did his fellowship at the Sir Charles Gardner Hospital in uh, 2012 in Western Australia and then came to Stanford for a three-year instructorship uh, in otology, skull-based surgery, and joined Stanford faculty in 2017. So Dr. Santa Maria, I'll let you go ahead and start, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much for the introduction. I'm, I'm really not trying to hide from you. I'm trying to work at my video on in the, in the corner. Um, so if I figure out how to do that during, during the meeting, that'd be great. I'm also trying to keep this uh, as informal as possible, but also notice that the, the format is difficult. So um, I'm trying to open this, the chat bar up. Um, so if you wanna send me questions during the talk, that's okay. But I also don't mind if you wanna just jump in. But first of all, um, thank you very much for, for having me. Uh, of course, I would have loved to have been there in person um, to talk to you and meet, and meet you all. Uh, but I understand the challenges of the current situation. Um, and I think part of the introduction shows some of my background, but I guess another part of the background that you may not be aware of is the fact that I'm also um, Associate Director of Stanford Sparks Translational Research Program. And I think this uh, presentation and the research behind tympanic membrane um, regeneration and uh, therapeutic translation kind of intersect. And I'm happy to sort of share that with you. I obviously do have a very relevant disclosure because a lot of the work that I'm about to present to you have actually evolved into a company. Um, so please bear in mind and you're welcome to take anything I say with a grain of salt. So I think these sort of presentations are always nice because you can throw up little nice pictures of where, you, where, you, where you're living. Um, but you know, this is much of an imagination to me as it is to you because of course the inside of my house probably looks like the inside of your house. Um, so I, I guess this is just reminding me what it looks like outside, but I'm, I'm really staying inside like the rest of you. Um, and of course, I'm part of a fantastic team up here um, at Stanford. Um, we've got a, a fantastic division um, and where I'm heavily supported by a lot of great colleagues. And we also have this, uh, this lab that we call the Odo Innovation Lab, where we have a, a bunch of people that are really uh, doing translational medicine uh, grouped together. Um, and of course, as I mentioned, um, the SPARC program is, is really uh, big here. It's been running for 13 years um, and uh, really is at the forefront of translational medicine. So I'm going to give you an introduction to that as well. So the SPARC program was founded 13 years ago um, and it was really founded by Daria that you see in the center there. Um, and she was frustrated at the fact that she was trying to translate a therapeutic but actually had no help. Um, and she sort of carved her own pathway and figured out how to do that. And she translated her discovery into a clinical trial, um, which then exited to a, a large pharma company. But all the learnings that she did and all the friends that she met, um, she put together. And now we have about 100 different uh, industry mentors, um, maybe more like 150, uh, where we get together every Wednesday night and work through projects um, of translational medicine. So the other thing is um, we have about 60% success rate. You can see there that we think success in Spark is um, trying to get um, new therapies to patients. So some of that involves taking it into startups. Some of it is involved uh, direct licensing to, to pharma companies and others uh, direct licensing without, um, uh, without uh, any intellectual property associated with it. Some of them were actually able to start direct clinical trials out from. And Spark itself has extended all around um, the, the, the world. Um, and actually, it's really interesting, uh, given the current pandemic climate, there's a lot of international collaborations that can be quickly mobilized for that purpose. Um, so Spark um, gives uh, funding-based milestones. It's a very modest amount of funding. It's about uh, 50 to 70,000 uh, per year, um, which, you're, which sounds like a lot. But it, you know, to do a lot of these uh, experiments that, that need to be done translation, it really is a drop in the ocean. But the main value is the fact that it's mentored by industry veterans. So um, I think people are aware that the Bay Area has a lot of um, biotech around the area. So it's really the, the amalgamation of the academia and the, and the industry that makes it successful. But I'm sort of more interested in my role in Spark at what, what happens when we don't get it wrong. 
um, about 40% um, actually fail or actually never make it to a human. And if we look only five to 10% and fail because of the proof of concept, the POC, which is really the science. Um, and we know that in academia, science is pretty well done, but uh, unfortunately about 30 to 35% is what we deem to be people failures in that people just go on to do other things or they get disengaged or they start fighting amongst themselves and, and really fall apart and never actually achieve their, their outcomes. And other people might also be familiar with this, uh, it's, it's almost this new age, uh, this concept of design thinking, which uh, also had some origins in the Bay Area. And if you look at design thinking, uh, you know, at, at a very basic level, it's, it's this idea that uh, you need to empathize with the problem all the way through to prototype to implement your, your new treatment. Um, and of course, people are familiar with these sticky boards uh, with all these notes uh, stuck all over them with, with these brainstorming. But really, if you wanna take design thinking a little bit further, there's a lot of criticism around design thinking and the fact that you know, maybe it's just a buzzword and, and really it's, it's, it's not really achieving anything meaningful. Um, there's a lot of people that have looked at design thinking and going into deeper concepts in design thinking, but a lot of what I'm going to teach you um, from what I learned is, is actually based in design thinking and the lessons that we've uh, learned here at Spark. So hopefully you're not wondering this too much, but I did wonder this myself, is what, what relevance does design thinking have in drug development? Uh, and it goes, of course, with the caveat of saying, firstly, is that discovery science is the foundation for translation. So we cannot um, translate science that doesn't exist. So without uh, a really uh, solid foundation in discovery and sometimes understanding me things mechanistically and going places where you're not sure, really sure where they're going to go, um, really underpins a lot of the work that uh, translational scientists build upon. So the first step um, when looking at uh, how to integrate the design thinking approach to therapeutic translation is first, we try to undo this sort of thinking that a, a lot of academics, including myself, have in this, we have this technology looking for application. So just like Rick Moranitz in Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, we're incredible um, inventors. We sit in our labs and we come up with great discoveries, but we really don't know what to, what to do with them. Um, and then we go out and say, well, what, what, can, what can I actually do with that? And Paul Yock, who's the founder of Stanford Biodesign, actually undoes that thinking and says, well, you actually need to go to the heart of the problem and understand the need behind the problem before you can actually invent, rather than finding an invention uh, that's going, that goes and looks for a need. So the kind of the mantra that we use at Spark is to begin with the end in mind. And so what does that mean in terms of, terms of therapeutic discovery? Well, it means that you need to bring the human context earlier into drug discovery, not at the end. And of course, um, you need to look at the target product profile, which I'll explain to you in a little bit. So also uh, in my introduction, you, you and if you haven't figured it out by now from my accent, I was uh, born and raised in Australia. Um, I come from Perth, which is down the bottom left there. Um, it's actually the most isolated city in the world, which is actually really good for, the, for a pandemic. But um, you know we have the uh, the best beaches that you can see there in the bottom right. We have really good parks and really good rivers. When I look at these photos, I wonder why I left. But um, you know it was a really good opportunity um, during my training, where we would uh, during my residency we would get in and and fly to the north of the country. Um, and Western Australia really is, or Australia really is a country as you can appreciate. Western Australia is six times the size of California but only has a population of 2 million, which kind of all live around this little city in the bottom left, Perth. And we would um, jump in these little planes and we would spend about four hours flying to Port Hedland and another three hours flying into the... Uh, this color change happens from these beautiful beaches and parks to this really red like uh, sand. And this is where we would be dumped in these um, uh, Aboriginal communities we would see uh, you know, 50 to 100 uh, of these uh, children uh, every day uh, in our clinics. And they all looked uh, the same. In, in fact, the public health there was terrible. Um, they would all have uh, flies going in around and, and sort of animals going in and out of their houses. So it really was a hotbed for the problem, which I'm about to tell you about. So we would run these clinics, um, 50 to 100 kids. We wouldn't have time to talk to them because there'd be so many. And every single little kid had one of these things when you looked inside. And I know all of you would recognize this as the scourge of otitis media. Um, certainly in the Australian Aboriginal population, 
the incidence of uh, chronic suppurative otitis media is 45%. So it is the highest incidence of anywhere in the world. So you know we got very good at uh, you know these quick short visits uh, to the to the Kimberleys in in the north of the country, and understanding uh, the scourge of, of otitis media in that population. What did we do for these kids? So of course you you we were very limited in in what we had. So this is actually uh, an insert from what we used to tell the local doctors there, and we used to do this process called dry mopping. We literally roll the Kleenex into the ear and soak out the pus. And then we would fill up the syringes with betadine and sterile water and flush the ears till they were relatively clear. And then we would add in some fluoroquinolone topical drops um, such as uh, floxacin. Um, of course, that was really all we had up there. And, and uh, some kids were lucky enough to go through to surgery, but really um, we didn't have any shortage of patients to treat there. One actually interesting, one of the uh, things that all drop in incidence of otitis media at least chronic suppurative otitis media, was the installation of chlorinated pools in the schools there. So at least every day the kids would come to school, they would get their ears and eyes and noses washed out with chlorinated pools. It actually gave them a little bit of wash. Those of you that uh, I guess everyone here is very familiar with chronic suppurative media and the problem of chronic tympanic membrane perforations. And it really is uh, a scourge all around the world, but predominantly around this uh, equatorial region, this peri-equatorial region of which the Northern Australia uh, falls into. And it actually is the leading cause of permanent hearing loss uh, in the developing world, affecting around uh, over 300 million people worldwide. It has an incidence of around 10% uh, in, in Indigenous uh, North Americans, uh, but even uh, up to 1% in high income North Americans. So it still is relatively common in the US. And what does this lead to? Well, in the US, it leads to 170,000 tympanoplasties done every year. So of course, starting with the end in mind doesn't just mean looking at the human context, but when we talk about therapeutic development, we need to think about the health economics. And of course, there's a bunch of different players that sit here on the left, um, the health insurers that obviously determine who gets operated on in the US. And when you look at the health economics of tympanoplasty, uh, we, we predominantly use autologous fascia or cartilage. Um, it's relatively resource intensive uh, in, for, for what, what we, we do. So, you know, it is, it's an outpatient admission. Uh, I'm sure uh, the house clinic, just like Stanford charges a premium, we charge around twenty twenty one thousand dollars $21,000 for, for, for tympanoplasty, which uh, seems very large. I definitely don't get that in my pocket. Um, but we have, um, we have a modest efficacy. If you look at it, it's around about 80%, 80 to 90%, um, depending on which studies you read. And there's lifestyle restrictions, of course, that go with that, that, that patients are restricted whilst they heal. If you add up these, uh, these fees associated with tympanoplasty, multiplied by the number of times that we do it, it's around, uh, it's over a billion dollar in healthcare costs for the system. So, um, you know, if we look at the outcomes of tympanoplasty um, here on the left, you can subdivide the outcomes according to, according to age, um, you know, whether or not the, the ear is wet or dry, but you know, I think if you look down here at the bottom where it says the mean, it's kind of landing in the 85% success rate uh, category, depending on the various factors. Um, and actually, if you look at, if you had a treatment, I said I could treat you if, uh, and, and, and I guess cure you of your problem 85% of the time, you know, I'd, I'd take that. And I guess most of your patients and mine do take that. Um, so really the problem is not trying to make a better tympanoplasty, but the problem necessarily is that the, the, pro, the costs associated with tympanoplasty on, on, the, uh, on the healthcare system. And the drivers of that cost are the fact that you have to have a hospital admission, a general anesthesia, and a surgeon involved. So of course, if we're designing an ultimate treatment before we even think about what we need to do, ideally it would be uh, good if it was topical. If it didn't involve surgery, setting it could be local anesthesia and could be done uh, so this is where we start to look at the end in mind, looking at the target product profile. So this is just a random target product profile of not an ear drug, um, but you can actually see what goes in it. And uh, in fact, I challenge any of you, in fact, I rarely do this, but open up the drug insert of a uh, uh, inside the box of a drug and actually read the labeling that goes into it. And you can actually read the labeling and actually get an idea of what has gone into the approval um, of getting that drug to market, especially looking out for these black box warnings here, um, looking at indications, dosage, adverse reactions.
But when you start to uh, conceptualize a therapeutic, we actually start with this as a blank page. And we often ask um, uh, people to start to put uh, how they think that their target product profile or that drug insert will start to look, look like. Of course, uh, uh, we're very good at thinking about indications and usage and how it might be used, but we're not good at thinking about um, toxicity profiles, especially for drugs that we don't know how they're going to work. Um, you need to think about storage supplies and conditions. Of course, most of these patients that we're treating, at least for uh, chronic suppurative otitis media, might be in the third world. Uh, so, of course, it's, if it can be it's, it may actually not penetrate to the, uh, the area that we need to, to get it to. Um, of course, there's other uh, considerations that academics usually do not think about, and that's in terms of the health economics that I've just kind of presented to you. The intellectual property around it, because Unfortunately, the pathway to getting there is, is, is actually getting, usually getting a, a big pharmaceutical company to get interested in you. Um, and if you don't have any intellectual property behind you, uh, or at least consider the regulatory considerations, it can be very difficult. So this is where my story started. Um, I, uh, in Australia, you, we actually have a really good program during when you're um, training as a resident. You can actually do a, a combined PhD residency. And so I, I decided that I'd do that. Um, um, and uh, Marcus Atlas um, was my supervisor. Um, and he, uh, you know, he actually has led a lot of world leading research around this um, uh, silk fibroin scaffold for growing keratinocytes on it. So there's this, uh, there's this worm and it produces this silk. And you can actually see that in the middle, it's this sort of clear drum that can be implanted um, as a replacement for tympanoplasty. Um, and this was a, a while ago, I think maybe 15 years ago, um, when uh, Marcus actually said, you know, Peter, can you test this for us? And I'm going, well, that's such an exciting thing. I'd love to. Um, the more I looked into it, I figured out we actually didn't have any suitable animal models to test it in. So I was like, well, how are we going to test this if we don't have an animal model? And then I said, well, that's all right. I'll, we'll, we, we can make one. And the more that I looked into it, the more that I found out how we did not understand tympanic membrane wound healing enough to create an animal model. And so this is where, um, you know, we went, uh, went uh, progressively stepped backwards into the real, the basic science around tympanic membrane wound healing of which I'm gonna share with you a little bit of background. So of course, we know that the tympanic membrane is a trilemma structure. Uh, the, the lateral surface is, is pretty much like skin. It's a stratified squamous epithelium with a middle uh, connective tissue layer with various arrangements of collagen fibers and elastic fibers, which give that uh, especially the past tense of that, that elastic nature. The inner surface is um, respiratory type uh, mucosal epithelium. And it was really um, Alberti who defined uh, what we understand as tympanic membrane migration in the 60s, where he did this really novel um, uh, ink, dot te ink dot technique where he would place black ink dots on the, on the past tense and watch over time and take serial photographs and watch the migration of that. And that's where we learned that the migration pattern of the tympanic membrane really was, uh, was out from the malleus here, uh, out in radially in, 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 in that pattern. Um, and that's how we understand um, tympanic membrane wound healing. And that's why I guess all of us are very familiar in telling patients uh, that the, L, the ear is a self-cleaning uh, mechanism. It is, one of, it is actually the only area in the skin, sorry, the only area of skin in the body where lateral migration happens at rest or happens in, in the normal state. Uh, because lateral migration of, uh, of skin usually only happens in elsewhere in the body if there's an injury. So uh, during my research, uh, I, I, I did this sort of time point study where I had um, rats. And uh, as you can see here on the top, uh, on the right hand side, I would perforate the upper outer quadrant with a little needle and then uh, take not only serial photographs, but then um, take uh, serial histology um, slides uh, over time. And I would also um, do a study later, which was looking at um, uh, the genomic information that was coming out of that. Um, you can see here in the top right corner, after 24 hours, um, you can see this area of white that's sort of around the handle of malleus there. You get this injection from this inflammatory exudate, but you can already see there's something happening here around the edge of the malleus. Uh, by that day four in the rat, you can see this um, uh, scaffold that's starting to grow over the tympanic membrane perforation. Um, and by about day seven in the rats using this uh, model, that um, perforation is completely closed um, and, and covered. And that's when remodeling occurs. And we can map that out um, uh, using uh, you know, various uh, growth factors 
uh, and various other things um, that go in there. But I think what the take home message is there is that it is in three stages, as we understand tympanic membrane wound healing. There's the, there's the inflammatory stage that happens within the first 36 to 48 hours. There's a secondary proliferative stage, which happens, um, and then the, of course the remodeling stage. The difference here and what you're seeing here to what we understand is normal skin wound healing is that in the skin, like in, or, or even in the oral cavity with, with mucosa, another area that I investigate, is that you get a, uh, when after injury, you get this bed of granulation tissue that kind of floods in, and then the skin migrates over the top. Whereas in the tympanic membrane, as you kind of see in that panel G across on the right, uh, the keratinocytes, rather than being followers, they're actually leaders and they kind of take this leap of faith uh, into, into thin air and it's the keratinocytes which are the leading edge of the wound here rather than the followers. And there's been a lot of work which has been done by uh, both the, my original lab and others sort of uh, characterizing, defining these, uh, I guess we call them progenitors or you know, stem cell like cells. Um, where they, uh, they are keratinocyte progenitors that are around the handle of, of the malleus. Um, it's, I guess, why a lot of us have learned to try and preserve the malleus as much as possible when we do tympanoplasty. Um, but you can see here on the left, you can see uh, after a perforation where the little asterisk is, you can see there's not much action at the rest of the TM, but you can see this, this remarkable uh, this change that happens uh, around that perforation. If you were to zoom in further, most of this that's happening on the malleus side is keratinocytes, whereas most of this is, that's happening on the annulus side is actually an inflammatory reaction that's growing across. So the predominant uh, uh, repair mechanism is still from malleus out to annulus. So um, as I inferred before, um, uh, this was a really large study um, that we looked at the uh, transcriptome profile of wound healing over seven days. And you see there on the top right, that's pretty much every single um, gene and what it was doing. And you can also see that you can also get the idea that it's a bit of a mess. There's just thousands of genes there uh, and you can zoom in on them individually. If anyone has any interest that it actually is publicly available and people can examine uh, different genes. But out of that, um, I had some ideas on actually taking it forward into an animal model, which I'll describe now. So the other interesting thing about animal models, and this is really re relevant for translational medicine, is that you have to define an animal model that mimics hu the human condition. So uh, of course, we can stop uh, tympanic membrane wound healing by putting formalin on the edge, but is that really uh, relevant uh, to how um, uh, you know, the tympanic membrane perforations are in real life? Um, the FDA loves to look at well-established models. So if there are established models using in the disease that you're looking at, these are really, uh, these are really important. It's also really important to uh, choose relevant species. I mean, you don't need to use a large animal as an animal model if your mouse or rat is indicative of the human situation. There's this uh, concept of um, GLP versus non-GLP. And for those of you that aren't familiar, this is just this is good laboratory practice and it's a set of standards of which the FDA looks at. Um, you can actually, most people do not do GLP as a first line, but it's something to keep aware of um, and I'll bring up later on in the talk. So this is where I looked at, uh, obviously a lot of the research had suggested that keratinocytes, as I mentioned, they, they were the ones taking the leap of faith uh, and they were the leading edge of this wound. So um, I've, I came across some research out of Japan that had looked at um, corneal um, wound healing and that they were able to inhibit keratinocyte migration using this um, metallo matrix proteinase inhibitor, KBR7785. And they were able to, able to inhibit, it, inhibit it for four or five days before it recovered. And I thought, hey, that's really interesting. Um, it was such a dramatic, as you can see there by the arrows, dramatic um, uh, uh, cessation of keratinocyte migration. And I wondered if that would be able to be translated uh, into um, the tympanic membrane. So I took that, uh, that KBR775, I literally um, squirted onto gel foam daily in a subtotal perforation in mice. Um, and then I, didn't, I did that daily for a week and then I left it alone for three months and I came back. And what I'd found that was that, was that almost 90% of those were still open and, and had not healed uh, after that three month period. Um, doing histology on that, I could see that uh, if you use this brown keratinocyte staining, um, that there was this inhibition of keratinocyte migration. And also looking at the chronic wound edge, you could see here the mucosal layer had obviously migrated around and joined the, the cutaneous layer. 
similar to how we see in, in human um, chronic perforation edges. So of course, I just told you that it needs to replicate disease. So we do know that tympanoplasty is a disease, sorry, the uh, tympanic membrane perforation is a disease that often involves eustachian tube dysfunction. And, and so we developed a model also to test that where we did a trans cervical approach to occlude the eustachian tube in, in mice. Um, we also um, know that it's not a usually a sterile condition that I just showed you through the Australian Aboriginal population where we uh, also inoculated um, the, the ears um, and created chronic biofilms using, using Pseudomonas. So before I gave you this very messy picture of a lot of genomic information, and then it becomes to how do you actually make a choice in what to do with that? So this is where actually it was very, um, uh, very fortuitous that the time around that I was making the decision, I, I went to Stanford and uh, got involved with two very specific programs. Uh, uh, one is the biodesign program and one is the SPARC program, which really helps you take the next step in making a choice. And one other uh, bit of research that's kind of funny is that, you know, if you look at how do you make a choice, well, this, this study came out of uh, Stanford a, a while back, but it shows you how you having too much choice is actually a bad thing. So they would set up little jam stalls in the supermarket and they would have shoppers come in and they had uh, one stall where they would have 24 jams and another with six jams. And they actually found that if you provided six jams, 30% of shoppers would buy, would buy a, a jar of jam as opposed to only 3% with 24 jams. And what they had this decided from that and a lot of following research is that having too much choice actually paralyzes you from actually making a decision. And therefore, um, one of the uh, main principles around Spark and Biodesign is to whittle down all your choices to around a group of about three to five is what they think is optimal. So this is where a lot of work that we do um, in the Odo Innovation Lab, because we have a lot of uh, great people that have great ideas. And this is how we try to get you to understand how to make a choice. So I'm happy to share this with anyone uh, offline if they would like sort of this template that we use. But it pretty much takes people through um, a process that we do to understand. And, you know, most of us are having so many great ideas all the time, but we're also thinking, you know, is this worthwhile? Should I waste my time on it? Or should I just keep thinking to that next, uh, that, that next exciting idea? So this is a real a good template to sort of start with, but it takes people through the process of understanding the problem, what are exist as treatment options, and really trying to get an idea of where, that uh, where a potential solution might have an impact. So doing that process, um, we were able to, I was able to define what we call a need criteria um, for, um, uh, to, for healing this problem of uh, chronic tympanic membrane perforation. So of course, it needed to work, it needed to stimulate keratinocytes. And what I showed you before, it needed to be topical with that anesthesia, um, needed to be applied by ENT, and of course, needed to be safe. It would have been nice if it was um, delivered in a sustained release formulation where you could give it once off and it could be quick, all those sort of things. Um, and this is where, before you even think, if you have a, multiple different ideas, you can rank them and you can do this uh, semi-objectively where you have like a, a need criteria on the left of those things that you previously defined that your solution needed to have and your ideas across the top. And then you would score them like six, seven, eight or whatever. And then you would multiply that by the weight, end up with an overall score. And that would usually be your lead idea that you would take forward. So I'm gonna get rid of a lot of background here and show you that one of the lead ideas that I had, it wasn't my first, but it was, one of my lead ideas was using heparin binding epidermal growth factor like growth factor, which I'll just um, say as HBEGF for short, as, a, uh, as, as the idea that I took forward. Um, looking at my microarray da data, you can see on the left here, in that dark line, that's uh, EGF, which, I, which a lot of other researchers have looked at. And I thought, well, one thing that was striking if I opened it up to look at the family, HBEGF in the dotted line, really was upregulated just before keratinocyte migration and remained at that high level throughout the week. And that was something that kind of stood out to me as a flashlight. HBEGF is part of that EGF uh, family, as I mentioned, but it has very specific um, binding to her and her close to the whole. And it seems to be thing that selects different than binding across um, non-specifically. So this is where the Spark uh, program at the same time, I had this proof of concept that maybe HBGF would work. And this is where Spark comes in and actually uh, has these sort of uh, mantras on the left here where it actually gets you to involve other people that are outside your discipline to give you ideas. 
um, you, you consult, consult, consult. So you constantly talk to a lot of different people um, to get an idea uh, of, of how you might bring your idea forward. So it really was a, a big, um, uh, really heavily involved in catalyzing this going forward. Um, and one of the benefits of being here, uh, like many academic centers, is that there's the potential for collaboration. So I was fortunate to have uh, Peter Yang in orthopedics, actually in the same lab, lab building as two doors down from where I sit, um, who uh, doesn't know anything about the ear, but knows a lot about drug delivery and biomaterials um, in orthopedics. I, of course, uh, was learning a lot about the ear, but knew nothing about uh, drug delivery or biomaterials. So together we conceptualized this idea of delivering HBEGF using this, he used this kytosan based hydrogel, um, which uh, could be delivered by a dual bore syringe that you, that you squirt into the ear and it solidifies against the tympanic membrane. So then we went forward um, and uh, measured it in our uh, animal model. Um, the first member of the animal model one was just the perforation. Number two was with the eustachian tube destruction. Number three was with the pseudomonas. Um, and we actually had really striking results. So you can see here that the results in the middle was the, the treatment group compared to the control on the left, which was uh, vehicle only. Um, the vehicle probably provides a little bit of a scaffold, which is why there's some healing there. Um, but also, if you looked histologically at the, um, the comparison, the HVEGF um, group down here in the bottom, the brown was the, the keratinocytes, uh, so the keratinization, you can see really that it had, uh, it resembled what we would we used to seeing in the tympanic membrane, whereas the control, even though it healed, had this real fiber sticking with a real uh, immature keratinocyte layer. So this is where um, we were fortunate enough to have a, a, a really strong um, basic science group around me. And I was able to look at testing the hearing function um, after um, chronic perforation and, and HBEGF HB treatment. For those of you not used to looking at animal um, ABRs and DPOEs, of course, these are not normalized, so the hearing gets worse as, uh, as, the, as the line shifts up rather than what we used to seeing with the human. So at baseline, you can see the control there, um, the left side uh, uh, in, in the dark line and right dotted uh, side were equal. But after chronic perforation, you can see an elevation and threshold both in the ABR and the DPOAE. Um, then, of course, after uh, treatment, you see normalization of the ABR, still a little bit of uh, a gap in the DPOE, which uh, actually um, closed after about six months treatment. And this was, uh, you know, at, at least some preliminary, um, uh, I guess, results that confirmed that we were likely returning function as well as uh, histological structure. Uh, I was also fortunate enough to um, collaborate with Sunil Puri, who was at Stanford at the time. Um, and we did an experiment where we would place these little beads on our regenerated um, tympanic membranes and we use laser Doppler vibrometry to measure the vibration characteristics of the drum. And you get these kind of patterns that come out here and these frequency response curves. What you can see there is the blue is the control and the red is kind of the treatment. And what we interestingly we saw is that the, the treatment groups kind of sorted themselves into two groups. And you can see there the red group in the bottom graph the, the, we called them the high group and the green was the low group. So that the majority uh, actually ended up having a very similar control, control response, but some of them had a slightly less control response, uh, sorry, uh, frequency response. Um, and if you looked at those, they did have a little bit of you know, thickening or tympanosclerosis, um, but at least, you know, we were getting a, a good frequency response there. Um, but this goes on forward is that uh, in, in Spark, it's, it's really important to look at why drugs fail, fail um, taking them forward. And, uh, and if you look at how many make it from discovery into phase one, it's, it's less than 1% go on to phase one. And that really is abysmal. And folks, uh, so drugs usually don't fail because of mechanism. Um, they usually fail because of toxicity, which is about half the reason, uh, half the times the reason why it fails. And of course, there's something that we just cannot account for is a difference in the fact that we deal with laboratory animals and we, we're trying to treat humans. So the SPARC project um, actually turns a lot of the next, uh, the, the experiments that we're doing um, uh, next on, on the side. So in academia, it's, it's very important to go through things very stepwise. Um, and because you've been working on something so long, it can actually be very scary if your experiments start not to work. So SPARC actually, flips that on its head and says, well, do you know what, we, given the fact that a number of therapeutics uh, fail as they get to clinic, 
we want you to try and fail it as early as possible. And so we actually bring in experiments into the, uh, into the, the timeline a lot earlier that are more likely to fail uh, your drug. So we do a lot of toxicity experiments. We do a lot of uh, other safety experiments to look at uh, trying to understand what are the biggest risks that can kill your project um, in taking it forward and identifying those no or those go or no go points very early because sometimes you're able to pivot around them before you've invested too much time or money in that. Um, and other, other times uh, it can actually lead you to just going on to um, uh, better doing other things. Uh, of course, you know, the usual startup mentality of learning from your failures. Um, I think this is really important and something that we've learned at Spark over time is that those invest, uh, investigators that really are individually motivated to change the problem of what they're working on seem to have, have greater success than those that don't seem to have any um, direct individual motivation. So these are the translational uh, experiments that we would do. So this is just showing you that first we had to show, excuse me, that the delivery system was uh, non-toxic. We then had to show you that the drug was non-toxic and you know it's scary as an ac academic because you don't want to show that your, your drug is causing problem but you, the actual re um, reason behind these toxicity studies is you try to find toxicity you push the limits as high as you can go and usually that's acceptable as if you don't go at, at a dose 10 times higher um, and we found that um that the the drug wasn't toxic um we found that of of course if you inject HBGF directly into the ear, it wasn't absorbed into the systemic circulation. In fact, what we also found that if you inject it directly into the blood, there's so much background level of HBGF in the blood that whatever you're injecting into the ear is likely to be minimal. We did um, dose escalation studies to get, uh, get an idea of what the right dose was. Uh, we actually did um, super dose testing here, showing that the, the effect plateaued as, as you got a, over a higher dose. But of course, I could present you an unlimited number of experiments, but of course, at what point do I stop? So in academia, we, can, we only have a so, so many resources, and of course, pharma has a lot more resources, um, but they do call it the valley of death, the translational valley of death for a reason. There's a reason why it's so difficult for academics to, to bridge that gap to get into to the clinic. And that's where uh, the role of Spark and, and others in translational medicine really uh, talk about getting on the road talking to pharma companies, talking to industry, talking to venture capital and those sort of people, get an understanding of how far you actually have to get, get, get to before they can get it. So what would an industry person or a pharma company want from you before they actually took it forward and then pretty much hitting the milestones that they ask for? So this is where it really is fortunate being at a place where I am. Um, you can see this is just a, a, an overview of, of Stanford. We have a new hospital now. You can see at the top here, this is where our ENT clinic is. It's about five minutes walk to the hospital and it's another five minutes walk to where my lab is. And if you look at the top left map, it's actually a, even maybe a, a five minute drive to where all the money is on the venture capital on Sand Hill Road. So really you do re literally walk the, walk the walk and go start talking to these people. So when I did, it was, it was really interesting. So these are a bunch of references and they're, in, they're intentionally small because you're not supposed to read them. But it really, it really came uh, uh, to a head because when I would talk to these, uh, these venture capital groups, you know, of course they only spend about a, a few minutes looking at what you're doing and usually on, they're, spending, uh, they're on their smartphones the whole time. They're sort of rocking backwards and forwards and half paying attention. And they would just Google growth factor, a tympanic membrane and these things like FGF2 and EGF would come up. And then they would ask me, what about FGF2 or EGF? And I could explain to them scientifically. I could show them my microarray data. I could explain to them in so many different ways why I didn't think these two approaches uh, would be as successful as HBGF. However, it didn't get, most of them were just, I guess you could see their eyes glazing over as I was talking and I started talking more about science. So it really was a big barrier, the fact that there was two other potential growth factors out there uh, in the literature and so, um, and of course, there's a lot of uh, work being done in these, these groups, both in scaffolds and in growth factor therapies, but it was really not, um, and I'm gonna just skip over this in terms of time, but it really um, wasn't until I did this experiment that I got traction um, amongst pharma companies and taking it forward. So it's, it was probably the scariest experiment that I've done is that I had to put it head to head in our model, HBEGF um, against uh, FGF2 and EGF. And I found that really it, it was superior in terms of healing um, with the other two no, being no different than control 
and those where it did heal had this, uh, you know, this fibrous healing, um, just like the control, as opposed to this normal keratinocyte healing. And it was really as soon as I did the experiment that I was able to brush past a lot of those 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 questions about FGF2 and EGF, and that everyone sort of got excited. One of the people that did get excited was this uh, this Japanese kind of um, a pharmaceutical company, Astellas. They're sort of I think they're top 18 in, in the in the world. Um, and uh, in 2017, they signed a license to take it forward into the clinic. Um, and, uh, you know, it's tw 2020 now. And a lot of people said, what actually happened in those few years um, that have gone by? And this is actually um, a, a dinner in Japan um, with a lot of the lead, uh, uh, lead uh, scientific team um, where they were having a celebration. And that's uh, Wani in the middle there uh, 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 talking to me. And he would say, you know, Peter, we're really excited that this uh, this project worked. Um, you know, you should be congratulated that it all worked. And I said, well, um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm glad it worked, but we just spent two years replicating every single study that had ever done at Stanford in-house at Estellas um, because of the problems with academic reproducibility. And one, he actually told me, he said, this is the first time we've ever licensed something from a, from a, from a university and gone through scientific diligence and it worked. So that was really something that, that really was amazing to me that the fact that they tried to, to bring things out of academia so often, and this was the first time that it worked. Um, and this kind of brings up the, what, what we should all do. And, and this is actually something that's really important for all of us doing research in academia is that we really need to think about the reproducibility of our research. So um, Dr. Begley, um, who spent time um, at uh, Amgen, um, and actually, he did publish this, uh, this study, which is really incredible. Um, between 10 years at Amgen, he would go to every investigator that produced in, uh, in, in, in Nature and in other, uh, in other uh, top journals. And he literally sat in their labs and asked them to reproduce their experiments. And he found that, that 47 of 53 of those investigators that he investigated were unable to be, were able to reduce their reproduce their findings that they published on. And this is, this is crazy. Um, and in fact, what he found is that the higher the ranking the, the journal, the less likely you were able to reproduce your, your results. And so what he really found in there was that he, he actually only had six criteria of which the, the investigators need to reproduce the, the results. He needed that the studies were, were to be blinded, that the experiments needed to be repeated, and that there was a positive and negative control in there. So very basic scientific things. But a lot of these steps were being skipped by academia uh, in the in the in the drive to become successful. So one thing that I learned is that as we went forward, that uh, as we began to translate this uh, delivery system that we um, delivered, uh, that we conceptualized, actually couldn't be manufactured. Um, just going in short, it was a one to ten ratio that needed to be combined in, in the in the syringe, and that one to ten ratio syringe was, uh, we couldn't figure out a way on how to deliver it. So we actually had to change our delivery system. That's where it was a mistake on our part. We should have started at the beginning by uh, starting with something that could be manufactured. So this is kind of the current state of what it looks like. It's a, it's a, it's a gel. You can see there, it's getting, getting squirting out of a needle there on the left. Um, and over time at body temperature, this is just using a 3D ear in a cadaver ear. This is kind of how we envisage being, it being placed. Um, at body temperature, it takes about 30 to 40 seconds set to set. So the idea is that the patient sitting in a lying down on your chair is squirted on the drum. A little bit would flow into the middle ear, but it's very viscous. So it's very sticky and it would pretty much stick mostly to, to the tympanic membrane. Um, and then it would dissolve over time. So it was approved to, to go into clinical trials in November um, uh, last year. And another tragedy of this uh, COVID situation is that we were, or, uh, Estellas was supposed to begin recruiting phase one in March, but that's uh, indefinitely on hold uh, for the pandemic at the moment. So uh, another bummer from, from that. Um, and I just wanted to pause to, to show uh, that there is uh, a lot of other incredible treatments that are being um, uh, worked on in the tympanic membrane area, uh, growth factors and the scaffolds. But I guess it goes back to, um, whether or not they met the original target profile that I'd decided would be, uh, you know, addressing most of the problems with uh, tympanoplasty here, and that could all any of these be topical, involve no surgery, and technique. So we're winding up, and I really wanted to just show you that that a lot of my previous research was in tympanic membrane wound healing, but now this has gone forward into 
Uh, we've developed a chronic suffering otitis media model in the fact that we can take pictures of ears. You can see then they just glow red if they're, they're infected. And so we're now looking at a drug that inhibits tympanic membrane wound healing. We've repurposed HVEGF into the oral cavity. We're now investigating using this model how sensory hearing loss occurs in chronic suffering otitis media, as well as testing some novel um, therapeutics um, to get rid of biofilms in the ear. Um, so, so with that, I wanted to really thank everyone again. I'm really sorry, my, uh, during the talk, my chat window crashed. So I really apologize if anyone was uh, using the chat window. Um, and definitely would love to um, open up to questions and I will try and turn on my video so you can see me as well. Thank you. Well, Peter, thank you very much. That was a fantastic talk, uh, not only about your research, but also I think a very nice overview of uh, translational medicine from uh, laboratory to, uh, uh, to, to the clinic. So uh, congratulations on, uh, on all of your work. Thank you very much. Uh,